Well, this is a, a special day in the life of our church, graduation time, and we uh, send these off to a new future. And as I was share with them, sharing with them yesterday uh, morning at, uh, at the get-together at Four Rivers, really their faith is more important than anything else. In fact, I, I, I was telling them that I was going through my card catalog, and just to give you a little background, ever since I began preaching, I started a card catalog. Now, a lot of this is on computer now, but I still keep it physically as well. And so <clears throat> if I have a, like a card, an index card on faith, I will list all the messages that I've preached on faith over the years, and then it goes to the next card, the next card, once they get filled up, maybe 12, 13 or so on the card. <clears throat> And when I pulled out the ones on faith the other day, it was a stack. And I was thinking to myself, if I hold a value to something, and we all hold value to something, you know, in, my, in the preaching and the teaching of God's word, it's this whole idea of faith and believing God. It's like, it's like the hub of life and all the other successes of life really go through that. If you're going to balance the wheel and, and have a balanced life and have power in your life, to do all kinds of things, that's where it's really going to begin. And so if you believe that, then today's message really going to be a great encouragement to you. As we're looking at this passage in Romans chapter 8, we've been in a series of, of messages on the struggle is real, and certainly it is real. Now we look ahead, or the graduates look ahead, and they think, oh, look what I've got in front of me. And that's what all the speeches are made at graduation about, you know, hey, the, the future's in front of you, just go after it. But we, who have been there even just a few years ago, would say, well, yeah, you know, the opportunity's there, but wow, you know, it's tough out there in the real world. It's a struggle. It's a struggle almost at every step. We look at our society today, we have a, a crisis at the border, we have a crisis overseas, we have a crisis in, at the gas pump. Do we have an amen to that? And we have crisis everywhere. And it seems like, how can we go up against so much going on in our world today? And to put it mildly, we struggle on the inside, as Romans 6 and 7 and 8 really talk about. We know what the Christian life says, and we know that maybe deep down the hub of the whole life is our faith in God, but it's difficult to keep that. It's a struggle to believe, and it's a struggle to live the way we feel like we should live. We feel, you know, can I say this? We feel like we're losing. We feel like we're losing to temptation, losing to addiction, losing to those strongholds. You know, when Satan gets a little toehold and then a foothold and finally a stronghold in our life. We feel like we're losing. And Paul's message to us today is that we've already won. You remember the illustration I gave you last week about Arnold Palmer saying, you know, if there's one thing that he wanted to do before he stopped playing golf was to be able to go up on the 18th green on the final day of the Masters knowing that he had won. Already as good as won. He could relax, he could enjoy the moment, but see, we can't always enjoy the Christian life because we don't know whether we're winning or not when, when Paul says, you've already won. In fact, as he's looking at these verses in, in this chapter, he's saying in chapters 1 through 5, he says, look, you've been justified by faith. You have peace with God. You've been saved from the penalty of sin. So chapters 1 through 5 is all about salvation. As it were, that crisis experience in your life where you really receive Christ into your heart. But then a process begins, the Bible calls sanctification or holiness. And so I've been saved from the penalty of sin. And now I am being saved from the power of sin in my life. And he says, look, the law couldn't save you. And so therefore the law can't sanctify you. The law is there to define sin and to, to bring it into focus and let you know what you're doing right and doing wrong. But it will not give you the power to overcome it. But he says that we can reckon ourselves dead or count on ourselves dead to all that. Now, as he looks at chapter 7, we look at ch chapter 7, it says this, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh 
I serve the law of sin. So saying that, confessing, he's saying, look, wretched man that I am. I, I know that I, I'm, I'm trying to do the things that I need to do, but I, I just don't have, it seems like, the wherewithal to do that. But thanks be to God, Jesus is taking care of it. And from there, he goes into chapter 8. And he talks about, all through the book, in fact, the grace of God. As he's talking about the grace of God, the whole book's about that. In fact, we would know doctrinally very little about the grace of God if we're not for Paul's writings, particularly in Romans. And so he gets into this and he begins to say to us that there's grace that has given something to us in the past. There's grace that's given something to us in the present and finally in the future as well. And all of this is a word of great encouragement. In fact, he says this in uh, verse 37 of chapter 8 that we'll get to in just a couple of weeks. No, in all these things we are more than winners, more than conquerors. Now, we don't think about that term conquering. It doesn't mean as much to us as it did back in the Roman days. And so another way of saying that, we're more than winners. That's what it's saying. We're more than winners through him who loved us. So we're going to look at these things, past, present, future. And the first thing we want to see this morning is just the fact that the pardon, I'm going to start these with P's, all right? The pardon of grace is through the cross. That's in the past. Notice what he says in verse 1. There is therefore, what's therefore? Well, it's chapter 7, primarily. He says, he says, already, wretched man that I am, before that he says, for I know nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. And so he's responding to what he said so far. So therefore, he says, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What is he saying here? For God has not done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son and the likeness of sinful flesh to die on the cross for us. Now he says, what's happened in the past is that Jesus Christ has come and he's died on the cross. He says, therefore, there is now therefore no condemnation. No condemning. Now, if, there was no con if there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus now... How was it before? Well, here's what it says. Jesus said in John 15, 315, he says, For whoever believes in me may have eternal life. And then John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So here's what he says in the next verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So he says, look, in the past you were condemned already because you have to pay for your own sin, but now through the cross of Jesus Christ, he has paid for those sins. So that tells me a couple of things about myself. Two things for sure, maybe, maybe a little bit more. First of all, if Jesus Christ had to leave the splendor of heaven, as the song goes, to come to this earth and to die on the Roman cross for me, if he hung there on the cross, if he bled and died and the spikes were put through his hands and his feet, 33 and a half years on earth, leaving heaven to come here and die for me, that tells me something about me. First of all, I must be, there's something, there's something seriously wrong with me. For God to have to do that. There's something seriously wrong. In the first five chapters, he's saying, look, the person that's never heard the gospel is lost in their sin. The person that's moral. You remember Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's story where Dr. Jekyll said, I, I can do this on my own for three months. He spent all of his money trying to help the poor, but he just came down to the point where he was trying to be his own rescuer and not submitting to the, to the law of Christ and the cross of Christ. He says also the religionists, those who really practice religion but have never been born again. He says those people are lost for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. There's something just not right if God were willing to do that for me. Um, a couple of people maybe you've probably never heard of, actually. And uh, their names are uh, 
Sidney, and Beatrice Webb. Now, some of you are history buffs. You know that they were really the founders of the whole social ministry in England. And they went on the premise that man is basically good. You know, Rousseau's uh, philosophy, man is basically good. And if you just leave him alone, he's going to do okay. And, you know, we don't, we don't need any uh, retribution for anything, any laws for anything. He'll just know what to do. Well, they believed that man was basically good. And many people believe that even today. But at, toward the end of their life, after leaving Christianity, after not believing in God, Beatrice writes some letters and some articles and she says this she says all this time we've been trying done we've done everything we can to help mankind to help the people of Great Britain and yet there is something inherently wrong there's a pull to evil there's a draw to evil we just simply haven't been able to change anyone and until this tendency toward evil is eradicated Nothing can be done. I don't, think, I don't know if she ever came around to admitting again that Jesus Christ had to come and die on the cross, but there's something, there's something seriously wrong. It's just not kind of passing by. No, for God to come and die on the cross for my sin, there's something there that's seriously wrong. But then also, secondly, if Jesus Christ were to come, since he did come, to die on the cross for me, then there is something radically valuable about me something radically valuable about me and you as well how do we know something is valuable well whether it's a painting or say a baseball autograph by somebody like Babe Ruth you know way back I mean back in that day probably that baseball cost a quarter how much would it be worth today if Babe Ruth's Autograph was on the ball, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why? It's only worth what people are what? Willing to pay for it. Exactly. And so how valuable are you? Well, how much was God willing to pay for you? He paid for you by his own blood. He paid for you, your sin, on the cross. He took God's wrath for you on the cross. There's something valuable about us. 2 Corinthians tells us, for our sake he made him... To be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He's saying to us simply this. Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross for our sins. And because of that, we're saved forever. Notice what it says in verse 3. For God has done this, the law, weakened by the flesh. It couldn't do. The law could not save you. However... By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He's saying, look, he satisfied the penalty for sin. And therefore, now there is no condemnation to you. That old story about uh, the, uh, the son and the father being out in the wilderness and they're surrounded by a prairie field and there's a forest fire coming from one side and the other side and the other side and uh, also the other side they can't get out and so the thinking father put placed a fire around them and burned off all the straw and the old dead grass and the weeds around them and the son is thinking to himself dad you're trapping us in we're trapped everywhere and you're burning off what we're even standing on why are you doing that He said, you see, son, the fire cannot come where the fire has already been. The fire of God's wrath was poured out on the body of Jesus Christ. It's done. It's once and for all. He cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that point, he also cried out, it is finished. The debt has been paid. It's over. God has died on the cross. He died on the cross because there's something wrong, but there's something inherently, radically valuable about you. Well, you think to yourself, well, yeah, that satisfied the past, but what about what's going on right now? For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's this gift of God, which that's what grace is all about. It's just God's generosity to us. This any person should boast. But where do we go from there? Well, Notice the power of grace 
through his spirit. He's already said in verse uh, in chapter 7, in verse 18, he said, I don't have the ability to carry it out. In my flesh, he says, I just don't have the power to do what is right on a consistent basis. I just don't. So where does he say we get the power? In verse 4, at the end of the verse, he says, who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit now is involved in what's going on in our life. He comes into our life to save us. The very moment that we receive Christ into our heart, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us in order to recreate the life of Jesus in us over again. And he uses two words here, very important, walk and mind. Look with me in verse 4. Who walk not according to the flesh, but you're walking in the Spirit. The Bible says, keep in step with the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. James Meredith said this, Jesus did not come just to get us out of jail, but to rescue us from the sin that landed us in jail to begin with. And that's so true. It's not that he just, okay, I've gotten you out of prison, but you know, you're going to keep on sin sinning and going right back into the stronghold, right back into the prison, right back to where you, you started, and you're going to feel the same way you felt before. No, he has come to save us, and the, the theme to the book of Romans, remember, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Every time somebody receives Christ, they, they have a faith. Faith to faith, one person to the next, as the righteousness of God is developed in our heart. Notice, he says in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds, underline that word, on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Notice the contrast, the flesh, the Spirit. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for he does not submit to the, God's law. Indeed, it cannot, for those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, Paul again draws the contrast. And he's saying on the one hand, you can live according to the flesh or you can live according to the spirit. We think, okay, according to the flesh, well, that the, the works of the flesh are all kinds of immorality and all kinds of things that we shouldn't do. But it's also here, it's hostile to God because he, Jesus died for those sins. He died to set us free and we're, we're going back. And he's talking here about what is really on the throne of your life. Where are you setting your mind? Another word, interchangeable here, is heart. And the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. For from it flow the issues of life, everything in life. Colossians tells us this. Paul says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. So what is setting your mind according to the flesh? Setting your mind on the flesh means you're setting your mind on the things of this world and not the eternal world, not on heaven. In other words, it's not so... God says, oh, you be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. He's saying, look, what is important to you? What is vital to you? What, what is valuable to you? You set your mind on the flesh and all kinds of things get on the throne of your life. Because why? They're temporary. They'll never satisfy you permanently. And they're going to die off one day with the rest of the earth and die off with you as well as you go on to eternity. Those things are just not permanent. He says, set your mind on the things that count. Set your mind on the things that are really permanent in life, the heavenly things in life. Set your eyes, your mind, your heart. Your heart is just simply the causal core of who you are, the decisions you make, who you are deep down. Setting your mind on the flesh, earthly things, and we don't, we don't concentrate. You say, well, yeah, but I'm, a, I'm try trying to be good. Remember what Jekyll said. After Hyde, I think, I think in the story where he already killed someone, he was running from all that. He says, you know, I've got to do something. And so he says, I'm not going to drink the potion anymore. I'm going to make up for what Hyde has done. I'm going to make up for what is dirty in my own heart. And I'm just going to serve mankind. And he came to the park bench. And he's sitting there and hair, the hair of Hyde, begins to grow on his hands. 
He begins to shrink as hide as a smaller man. And the clothes are hanging off of him. And he realizes that it's all the same person. Because one man is trying to avoid God by being his own rescuer. And the other one's trying to avoid God because he wants to do the things that he just wants to do. It's the same person. Coming to realize at the end of the story, Robert Louis Stevenson, okay, I have two natures, but I'm the same guy. And I've got to deal with it. He says the Spirit of God is the power that's going to get you there. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. So when you invite Jesus into your heart, the Spirit of Christ comes to live inside of your heart. That is God in your heart. It's very difficult to think about God coming to live inside your heart and it not making any difference. And so please understand, you've got to understand this going to our third point in just a moment, the permanence of things. You've got to understand in your own heart and mind that once a person receives Christ, they are a new human being. They've they're, they got a new nature. They're new on the inside. Their desires change. Their outlook on life is going to slowly change. But he represents Christ, and he's there to mold us, as we said, Romans 8, 29, to mold us into the image of Jesus Christ, the way we are really originally designed to be, way back in the book of Genesis, when he says God created us in the image of God, to bring us back to that image, to make us more holy every day, to, to take off as it were, the grave clothes around Lazarus. Lazarus raised from the dead. Now, take off his grave clothes. We're still hanging on the grave clothes. But he's saying, no, it doesn't doesn't have to be that way. You are more than a conqueror through the Holy Spirit. He says, you receive the Holy Spirit at the very point of salvation. Look in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. How does he know that? Because he's talking to Christians here at Rome. And he says, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, How do you know that? Well, we'll come to that in just a moment. That that means salvation. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If you do not have that born-again, life-changing experience where the Spirit of God has come into you, the Bible says right here that you need to make that decision, that you're not a believer. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And he's already talking about the body of sin. He's not talking about your physical body. He's talking about this, this substance of sin in and, and your life. He says, that's, that's dead to you. You're more than a conqueror. You're a winner. And the Spirit is living inside of you. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he also Christ Jesus from, raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You do that, what does it say? The very moment you receive Christ. If you do not have the Spirit of God, if I don't have the Spirit of God, then I'm, I've not been saved. But then the Spirit of God is not already, always released in our life. Um, I love this illustration because it actually happened, uh, one of the things happened to me years and years ago. How many of you ever heard of a carburetor? Anybody here? distributor, all those kind of things. I'm not even sure cars have those things anymore. But um, and you tell I'm, a, I'm really a mechanic, you know, right there on the cutting edge of all that. But um, I had this car. My first car was actually a Mustang. And um, back then, gasoline was how much? What do you think? How much a gallon? 30 cents. on sale. 31.9 when there was no gas wars going on. I would put a gallon in my car, and that's about it. A dollar, sometimes a dollar's worth. Three gallons in the car, I'd I'd be able to go for a while. I'd always let it get almost down, you know, ran out of gas a couple of times. And so what had happened, my car wouldn't go. It was just sputtering along. So I pulled into a service station. And he, he asked me about my practices of putting gasoline in the car. And I told him what it was. And he said, well, I can tell you what's wrong. There's debris that's in the gasoline, and it gets through the tank, and it rests at the bottom of the tank. And then when it, it's going through, you know, what it, the, the tube that goes through it all the way, I don't think you call it that, but the little tube that goes all the way through to your motor, your distributor, your carburetor, all that kind of stuff is, is so clogged up 
with debris because it's coming out that your car won't go. He says, I tell you what, what I'm about to do, you, you probably could sue me for, but you're not really supposed to do this. But I can cure you right now for a buck, a dollar. I said, that sounds like a good deal. So he took um, the hose that you pump up the tire, the air hose that you pump up the tires with. He took that and put the, took it off the distributor cap and put it on that thing, and it, it blew all the air and all the debris back into the gas tank. He said, this, now this is not going to fix it, just, just temporary, but I just got to tell you what you do. Don't let your tank get below a, a quarter of a, a tank, and then you won't have a problem with it. Now, here's the problem in our Christian life. That gasoline is, is like the fuel. It's like the Spirit of God coming through us, the, the gas line coming through. We can compare that really to the, the, the way that the Holy Spirit fills us in this life. It gets full of sin. It gets full of debris. It gets full of neglect. And therefore, we're not connected. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is released in our life as we're filled with the Spirit. Not filled with the debris, but filled with the Spirit. Listen to what it says. The Bible says in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, And do not be drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Actually, it says debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's a joyful heart. Giving thanks always for all, everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How can we build our faith? Hey, let's, let's be thankful for what we have. And submitting yourself one another in the fear of God. But notice it says three things that you're going to have. A joyful heart, a thankful heart, a submissive heart. But you've got to be filled. You've got to be filled with the Spirit. Let me compare it to this. The man, I think the illustration here, is the man is drunk with the wine, or the woman's drunk with the wine, and they stagger. Why do they stagger? Their, their walk is controlled by the wine. Their speech then is slurred. It, it's controlled. Their mind is controlled, affected by the wine. He says, don't do that. Don't be controlled by that wine. But, in contrast, be filled that much with the Holy Spirit. Let it dictate your walk. Let him um, dictate your walk. Let him dictate your speech. Dictate the way you think. Think about you know, even the Holy Spirit dictating and guiding your worldview and your view on the Scripture. When that happens, the power of God comes through us. So Jesus is on the throne of our life. He's Lord of our life. We're asking God to help us, and he fills us with the Holy Spirit. And we know that because the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, self-control. If we don't have those things in a big package, then we have serious doubt that, that we're really filled with the Spirit. He says a joyful heart, a thankful heart, a submissive heart. We have to have those. If we don't have those things, you say, well, you know, maybe I've gotten off track here. Maybe the reason I'm having defeat is I'm not claiming the victory. The victory is already mine. The Holy Spirit already is there. The potential is there. The, the, the gas tank is, is, is filled up if I'd only let it come through the gas line. So there takes submission, repentance, and asking God for help. But see, we're more than conquerors, more than winners through Christ who died for us and gave us his Holy Spirit. But he says one more thing about the future, and I'll close. The permanence of grace is through adoption. Notice what he says in verse 12. It kind of changes things just a little bit, a little, little different uh, slant to it. So then, brothers, kind of summon things up. We are debtors, not to the flesh. We're not obligated to the flesh. You don't have to put up with that. You're not obligated to sin at all. You're not addicted to that anymore. You're not, you, you are not obligated to have strongholds in your life and, resist, and, and yield to temptation. Not to the flesh, to live according to the, to the flesh. For if you are according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He says, look, the, the characteristic of a person who lives by the flesh is somebody that's not saved. And it'll live in, in and death. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Hey, a new word here our passage children or sons of God for you did not receive the spirit of slavery 
to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which you cry, Abba, Father. You know, this is the word, you know, if I can say this, a southern expression, Daddy. It's, it's a very warm term. It's not blasphemous to say that. Jesus is the one that said that. And he says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Hey, listen, the more you suffer for being a Christian, that is, you're taking your stands for Christ, and you're witnessing for Christ, and you're, you're taking whatever is there, whatever society, the more, the more you're going to get. The more of an heir, the more reward you're going to get. But he says, look, verse 14, or 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Now, this is certainly um, in the Roman Empire. As he was writing this letter to the church at Rome, they more than understood adoption. Now, I'm not sure about the laws here. Not a, not a lawyer. But the laws in the Roman times was that if you had a natural child, you could disown them, disinherit them. But if you adopted a child, they were yours permanently. You could not disinherit that child. Paul was saying, this is something permanent. Now, you're already saying, no, no that won't save always save stuff, the, the security stuff. What you're saying, you can live any way you want to. No, indeed not. Paul has said that over and over and over and over again in Romans 6 and 7. He says, look, if you're really a believer in Jesus Christ, your desires change. The Spirit of God is going to lead you. And as he does, he's going to lead you forever. The Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. And notice real quickly the evidence is here. First of all, there's the witness of our lives. Verse 14, you're led by the Spirit. You're the sons of God. And so in our lives, we can say, yeah, I'm living in victory. Sometimes defeat. Sometimes I mess up. I'm like Paul. Sometimes I just can't seem to get the power to do what I need to do. I don't rely on the Spirit, but I have that desire. And then he says, there's the witness of the Spirit. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Children of God. That is verse 16. And he's saying, look, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, and there's something of assurance there. There's something, it's like you're, you are, are walking up on that 18th green of the Master's thinking, I'm three, four, five strokes ahead. There's no way, no way I could blindfold myself and still win the master. Something about taking that stress off. Something about working from victory instead of to victory. And then finally, there's the witness of the word. Once you know the spirit of God lives in, he's bearing witness with your spirit. It's just a promise. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. What a comfort that we're more than winners. We're more than conquerors. There's no condemnation to us because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. We know that he's working within us to not only come the, overcome the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. And one day we're guaranteed that we will be over, the presence of sin will be conquered in our life in heaven. Here's what the scripture says. He says, be encouraged. This is a, this is a word of victory. Paul has been going through all seven chapters. He comes to this one place. No condemnation. More than winners through Jesus Christ. That's who you are. And you can claim the victory in him. One um, story goes, in the Battle of Normandy back in World War II, there was a, a reunion, I think a 50, 60 year reunion, and they interviewed two different soldiers. One was on the ground, one was in the air. The one on the ground said, yeah, there were people dying all around me. I just thought for sure we're going to lose. We've already lost. This is a slaughter. But there was one that was flying from the air. And he gave the testimony. He says, I saw the carnage on the ground. But I saw the Marines coming in from the beach. I saw the planes flying overhead. I saw the bombs going off. And I knew we were going to win. A different perspective. Coming out of the truth that you know. Limited truth. To come out and see the bigger picture. And the truth, some of the truth at least, 
that God knows. You've already won. You've already won. Now, what about you that have never received Christ? You know, maybe you're like the guy that came to the pastor and said, look, I'm, I'm chained down with these addictions. I'm chained down with, with worshiping something else in my life, and I just can't get rid of it. And the pastor said, well, why don't you just come to Christ and bring your chains with you? man said, well, I never thought about that before. And he said, well, just come and bring your chains with you. He said, I'd like to do that. So he bowed his head and received Christ. And he says immediately he felt the chains, like it were grave clothes, drop off of him. Maybe that's where you are today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, but also no one moving around, please, for the next just minute. And uh, I just want to give an opportunity for those who have never received Christ to make that decision in their life. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know, if, as far as the witness of my life, if, if I were on trial for my faith, I don't think I'd be convicted. I don't even know if I'd vote for the conviction. And so you know in your heart that Jesus is not there. His spirit is not with you. Pray right now under the conviction of God, the pleading and crying out to God, call on his name right now. Pray this prayer with me. Lord God, I thank you for your love. I thank you that I was so valuable to you that you came and died on the cross for me. I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone to save me. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and guide my life. In Jesus' name.